Okay, so let's see. The last night we started looking at this homework problem with uh, uh, cellular uh, phone networks. So you have a long road and you have a bunch of houses that have to be covered by um, mobile phone service, right? And you want to do that while putting the smallest possible number of uh, base stations. So, and the assumption is that the base station has a range of 5 kilometers, right? Now, let's first see what is uh, uh, tempting to do, uh, but it actually doesn't work. Uh, just as a first wild guess, if you have something that looks like this, where would you put the first uh, base station? Okay, but uh, uh, we are now looking at the wrong solution, just to kind of see. Highest density of houses? Highest density of houses, you see? Because it looks appealing, because if you put a base station here, you cover as many houses as possible, so the fewest number of houses are left to cover with the remaining part. Right? But uh, in fact, it's easy to see that uh, uh, this, uh, this does not work. Right? Uh, simply because uh, maybe uh, all of these can be done by putting somewhere here and putting a base station somewhere here and it turns out that it would be superfluous to put anything here and you had to put something closer to the edge so to, as to cover the uh, farthest houses, right? So uh, the, the moral is that you have to be really very uh, careful what is the quantity that you are greedy with respect to, right? So it's not always <coughs> the one that is kind of obvious. But uh, so what would be the logic here? The logic here would be to go to the extremes, right? So you consider the leftmost house. What do you know about this house? It has to be covered, right? And now you are greedy by covering that house in a way that maximizes the uh, number of ho other houses that will be covered. So this would mean that we put one base station that is uh, five, ki oops, uh, five kilometers uh, from that house, right? And in this way, we kind of maximize the number of houses covered on the right. Then we look for the first house that is not covered, and again, a repeat procedure in the same way. Yeah. <coughs> yes? So is it five k's each way? Sorry? Is it five k's each way? Five kilometers each way, yes. 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 <coughs> so uh, the radius is uh, um, of the base station is uh, uh, five kilometers. Five kilometers each way. Okay, now there was a bit of confusion. You know, uh, base stations do not have to be in range of five kilometers because the base stations are always connected by either fiber optic or microwave directed uh, link, high capacity link to the switchboard, right? So the, uh, the base stations themselves don't have to be within each other's uh, range. <coughs> okay, how would you show that this is optimal? <coughs> So the mantra is always the same. We say, okay, assume that there exists an optimal solution that is not greedy. What do we look at now? If the solution is not greedy, as you move from left to right, 
there will be a first place where greedy was violated, uh, right? <clears throat> so you look at this uh, station, you know that uh, it has to be five kilometers, within five kilometers of the first not covered uh, house, right? <clears throat> but uh, since it is not a greedy choice, uh, of course it cannot be further away than five kilometers because then this house would be not, <clears throat> would not be covered. So the only other choice is that it was closer to this house than uh, five kilometers. So what can you do now to make it compliant uh, a little bit more with gravity? You just move the station five kilometers where it would be, and now we have to show that that still works. Well, <coughs> it works because uh, by definition, it is five kilometers in range, right, of the last not covered house. And on the other hand, it can only cover more houses, not less, not fewer houses, than the, this, post, <coughs> this um, base station from the optimal solution. So you can move this optimal solution, <coughs> the, the base station from the optimal solution, a little bit farther the uh, road and you still have coverage uh, and lo and behold now this solution is compliant with greedy for one more step and then you simply say continuing uh, doing that we transform that optimal solution into, <coughs> uh, into the greedy solution okay so it's rather simple <coughs> excuse me here is a problem now for you. That was on the midterm. Um, I think it was it last year. It says the following: You have two <coughs> engineers. Uh, one of them starts from this end uh, and uses the greedy algorithm to place uh, base stations. The other one uh, starts from the other end. Uh, and uses greedy solution, greedy strategy to place the base stations. Prove that they will come up with equal number of base stations. <coughs> How would you do that? So you have two engineers. One does greedy strategy from this end. The other starts from the other end and does greedy strategy. And the claim is. Uh, no matter from which end you start, uh, you will end up with the same number, not the same placement of base stations, but with the same number of uh, <coughs> base stations. Why is that so? How would you prove it? Uh? Did you not just prove it? Because it's a point of optimal solution. Exactly. So the same? proof is trivial. We just proved uh, that greedy produces optimal solution. What does this mean? It comes up with the fewest number of base stations that can do the job. Well, <coughs> greedy from the left and greedy from the right must produce equal, pro uh, num equal number of uh, base stations simply because uh, they will both produce minimal number of stations that can uh, uh, do the coverage no matter how you place the stations, greedy or not greedy, right? Simply by optimality of the greedy solution, you come up, <coughs> you will always produce the same number, namely the minimal possible at all, of all possible <coughs> um, placements. Okay, uh, good enough. So, <clears throat> let's see now, uh, you have this um, party problem. <clears throat> so, for the party problem, actually the easiest way to do it is to visualize it. So, let me, <clears throat> let me do it here in several colors. <coughs> Oh, 
Okay, so what is the problem? You have a bunch of people and you want to throw the party. You want to throw a party, but <coughs> you want to make sure that, so these are all people that you have, and you want to choose a subset <coughs> in such a way that every person knows at least five other people present at the party, not five people all together, but uh, five people present at the party, and not know at least five people present <coughs> at the party. If you look at <coughs> all of the people, who are definitely ones that cannot be invited? Well, let's use red to denote relationship that people don't know each other. So <coughs> all pairs will be connected either with red or with green. Green if they know each other, red if they <coughs> don't know each other. So now from this complete graph that is two colored, right, in terms of edges, you want to select the largest possible subset so that every vertex has at least five red edges um, in the subgraph and at least five green edges in the subgraph. Okay. Which are the points that definitely cannot be included? If certain person knows fewer than five people, so he has fewer than five red, <coughs> sorry, fewer than five green edges emanating from him, right? Can he be included in the party set? No, simply because he simply doesn't know enough people all together, let alone from this potential subset. And the same thing is, uh, and that was a bit of a confusing part, applies to people that don't know each other. If I know everyone but say four people, I certainly cannot be included, uh, right? Because if I restrict the number of people, the number of people whom I don't know can only decrease, right? Because, <coughs> let's see now how we proceed. <coughs> so first you exclude <coughs> all vertices that have fewer than five green edges and fewer than five red edges, <coughs> okay? Now, are we guaranteed that in this subset everyone within the subset, within the subgraph, has five, at least five red and five green edges. Uh, no, because when you throw out, the, in the first round, when you throw out, out people, um, then some of the green edges will disappear, right? For example, if I exclude this and that person, because they don't know enough people or they know too many people, right? Now, both, uh, by throwing out these guys, both the number of uh, green edges coming out from this vertex and the number of red edges coming out from the same vertex can drop. So after throwing out uh, in the first round, people who have less than five green and less than or less than five red edges, we have to update our data structure. We have to <coughs> uh, uh, recompute how many green edges and how many red edges are left for uh, each of the remaining participants. And now we proceed in the same way. We throw away again those that have either less than five green or less than five red edges. And we keep doing that until either we throw out everyone and then there will be no party, right? <coughs> or eventually the construction will stabilize with a set in which everyone has at least five 
red edges coming out and at least five green edges coming out. Now, why is this an optimal solution? How would you prove that that's optimal solution? Uh, could you say that the optimal solution uh, means that anyone else who was excluded can no longer be included without breaking the... Uh, exactly. So here, the proof here is trivial and it's really... You don't have to prove anything simply because at each stage you excluded only people that have to be excluded. So you excluded only people for which, for whom you are guaranteed that they cannot be present and no one else. So whatever is left over must be maximal in size. Simply because you excluded only those that cannot be involved in the solution. Simple enough. So you see sometimes the proof is really just one liner, but sometimes it's a little bit uh, um, more complicated than that. Okay, let's move now to things that uh, I fear you hate, uh, uh, namely polynomial multiplication and uh, um, FFT and simplify. Okay, let's see how do we simplify the following expression. So it is I times uh, omega 64 omega uh, omega 32 15 7. Now, why do, you, do I give you this problem? It was also on one of the meetings in the past. You see, I have to check whether you understood FFT. If you don't understand what the roots of unity is, there is no bad chance that you understand FFT. So then I come up with something that tests your understanding of the roots of unity, and then I extrapolate if it went this part okay, probably the rest was okay too. So, um, how do we do this? What is it testing you? First of all, what is I? Obviously, this is kind of heterogeneous. These are roots of unity in a canonical form. And I, is I also a root of unity? Of what order? Well, you draw yourself a picture, look at the picture, and it tell you, tells you, here is i. If I take it to the fourth power, I'll get 1. So i is simply omega 4. So omega 64 to the 7, omega 32 to the 15. OK, now these guys are all of different orders, so they cannot be immediately combined. What lemma do we use now? Cancellation lemma, of course, because this can be written. You simply find the smallest common denominator for these guys. So this will be 64. And 64 is, of course, uh, uh, 16 times 4. So what is the exponent here? The exponent here so has to be such that if you cancel it out, with the order, you get omega 4. So what's on top? 16, right? Because uh, this is omega 4 times 16 to the power 16. And by cancellation lemma, this becomes exactly omega 4. And this is omega 64 to the 7. And omega, now omega 32 is omega 64 on what power? We, of course, we are multiplying top and bottom uh, by 2, so this is 30, so this boils down to omega 64 to the power, uh, what is this, uh, 46, uh, 53. Okay, this can be simplified just a tiny little bit more. Um, 
Uh, this is equal to omega 64 to the power 32 uh, times uh, omega 64 uh, and what is the left over? Uh, 20, is it 21? Right, and this, what is omega 64 to the power 32? This is just minus one, right? So this is simply minus omega 64 to the power 21 because this is seven, uh, 21, seven times three, it cannot be canceled more, so it's just minus <coughs> omega 64 to 21. So I just want to see whether you understand the basic arithmetic of the roots of unity. And uh, if you do, then I hope you also understood the... Uh, yes. So, because this is exactly sum of it is exactly 53, right? And but omega 64 to 32 is just omega uh, 2, which is just minus 1, right? So, omega 2 is just this guy, minus 1. Why this locomotion suddenly? What's, uh, so just make sure you understand basic uh, arithmetic on the, on, on, on the field of complex numbers. Okay. Okay, let's now do the, the next one. So let's do the next. <coughs> so you have to multiply the following polynomials px is equal a0 plus um, what is this uh, a2x squared plus a4x to the fourth plus uh, uh, a6 x to the 6 and u of x that looks like that as well but uh, have just p coefficients. Uh, okay. First of all, so it's in all of these problems the idea is to use the <coughs> techniques uh, that we uh, did in Karatsuba algorithm and the generalized Karatsuba algorithm, which is commuting between coefficient representation of polynomials and value representation of polynomials. Okay? But first you have to, you see, if you multiply these two polynomials, uh, what will be the degree? Hmm? 12. 12. So how many values would you need to uniquely to evaluate P and Q so that the, the product is uniquely determined? 13. 13 values. But here you are given to do this with only seven multiplications. So you have to do some trick. Well, what, do you, what can you notice here? Only even powers are present. So rather than multiplying these polynomials, I will actually multiply polynomial P uh, star of Y, which is A0 plus uh, uh, A2Y plus A4Y squared plus uh, A6Y cube and Q star Y the same with these, right? Um, how do I multiply uh, efficiently these two uh, polynomials? Now the product is uh, of degree 6, right? So in order to uniquely determine it, uh, um, how many values do I need? 
seven, seven values. So I simply compute p star at uh, minus three, p star at minus two, p star at minus one, p star at zero, p star of one, p star of two, and p star of three, and the same for q. Then I form a new polynomial, how shall we call it, c of, uh, c of y. And c of y will have a form c0 plus c1y plus, plus uh, c6y to the 6. And, but we know, because c of uh, y is equal p star of y times uh, uh, Q star of Y. So if I substitute for Y uh, from minus 3 to 3, I immediately get that uh, C at minus 3 is equal P star at minus 3 times Q star at minus 3. And finally C of uh, 3 is equal p star of 3 times q star of 3, right? Now, where are the only large number, multi of multi large number multiplications happening? In evaluating these guys, are there any large number multiplications? <coughs> no, because what is, say, p star uh, of, uh, say, 3? Well, p star of 3 is simply a0 plus 3a2 plus 9a4 plus, uh, what do I have? So what did I say? 3, so 3 times 27a6. Uh, Here, there are no large number multiplications. Because multiplication by a constant is doable in linear time, right? To, for example, to compute 3 times A2, you can either use the standard right, high school algorithm or simply say, well, this is A2 plus A2 plus A2. So it will involve uh, three additions uh, of A2 to itself. And we know that addition is in linear time with the standard high school algorithm. So in obtaining these guys and corresponding guys for Q, Q star, no large number multiplication took place. The only multiplication takes place where? <coughs> right here, because these depends uh, on A's and these depends on B's, uh, right? Uh, and these can be arbitrarily large. So here I have seven multiplications. And then you simply say, by the standard technique, we can now solve this because this is simply C0 plus C1 times minus 3 plus C2 times minus 3 squared plus, uh, plus C6 minus 3 to the power 6 equal uh, P star of minus 3 times Q star of minus 3. So we have this value, and this will simply produce a linear combination of C's. Uh, and of course, all other six more equations like this, you will have six, sorry, seven, a uh, system of seven uh, linear equations with seven unknowns. Uh, uh, or you can simply say this is solvable by simply inverting the corresponding matrix. In the corresponding matrix, I will only have constants, like these powers of minus 3, 3, and whatever, right? So the resulting vector of the coefficients will be simply vector of coefficients is m to the minus 1 times the vector of these values, p star minus 3, q star minus 3, all the way to uh, p star of 3 times q star 
of gradients. Right? So these are all constants. So when you multiply with this vector, you will get vector of the coefficients without any large number multiplications, right? So it's really simple. Sorry, what, yes? What was the M? M is the matrix that is generated by this. So what is M? M is the following matrix. 1 minus 3 minus 3 squared <coughs> all the way to minus 3 to the power 6, right? And then 1, 3, 3 to the 6, right? All the powers. Because that's when you multiply these with the coefficients, uh, uh, you get the values, right? We did that with Karatsuba uh, 3. So for this matrix M, we have that uh, M times uh, C0 C1 up to C6 is equal to uh, C at minus 3, C at minus 2, all the way to C at 3, right? So these are precisely the powers of the input values, just like in the generalized Karatsuba algorithm that we did. So if I have these, then of course, C vectors are simply n to the minus 1 times this vector of C's. What are these guys? Well, these guys are simply P star at minus 3 times Q star at minus 3 all the way to P star 3, Q star 3. Seven values, right? So this will be here, C at minus 3 up to C. At three, and lo and behold, when you do the multiplication, no large number multiplication takes place. Yes? Why is it okay that we use minus three and three? Why don't we have to use the roots of unity? So because we're limited to seven terms? Simply because this is, you can use, of course, the, you see, here you can use any seven values that are distinct, and the whole thing will work. Now, of course, the, and, uh, the thing is that if you use uh, roots of unity, they are complex numbers, so both evaluation and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the interpolation will be harder because you have to do uh, flows. For example, if here A's and B's are <coughs> integers, uh, this will guarantee you without any uh, incurring any round of error that you will get integer values for uh, for the C's, uh, right? Because they are the coefficients of the product. So yes, you can use any seven distinct. And notice, in fact, uh, this might be uh, even a better choice because here you have to compute minus three to the power six, and that's quite large. So it's your choice with the roots of unity, it would work perfectly well as well. So any, uh, any uh, distinct input values uh, of the corresponding number, namely degree plus one, are enough. Yes? Uh, this is a kind of similar question. Um, can, do we consider multiplications of two complex numbers to be theoretically equivalent to multiplications of two real numbers? That's a good uh, question. In fact, this would uh, increase the, it was, uh, if, you, if you do it with the roots of unity, you would have to, um, uh, to count uh, products uh, double, even though a modern hardware actually has uh, I think that it can do product of complex numbers in a single plot cycle. I think the latest standard for dealing with floating numbers actually it has that study for that it's complex. So, but uh, yeah, that's a, the, the, so the underlying thing is uh, uh, any three, any sufficient number of distinct values will work. Uh, module of this uh, caveat about multiplication of uh, complex numbers to be more expensive than... Okay, how many real multiplications does it take? Uh, what's the fewest number of uh, floating point multiplication 
that the multiplications needed in order to multiply two complex numbers. Well, let's solve this problem because it's really uh, relevant, highly relevant to what we are <laughs> So you have two numbers, uh, A plus IV times C plus IV. What is this? This is AC, right, uh, minus BD plus I times uh, 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 I times uh, AD plus uh, uh, BC. How many multiplications do we need uh, to perform in order to get this product? Three. Three, very good. Not four, but three. How would you do it? Three. Exactly. Essentially, it's the same trick. Uh, notice that uh, uh, I would compute uh, AC, I would compute BD, but to get this, uh, I simply do A plus B times C plus D, because this is equal to AC plus BC uh, plus AD plus BD. So now, because I have AC and BD, I can subtract this and I can subtract that and what I'm left with is precisely what I need here. And too bad you asked me that because I wanted to give you this one on the midterm. Okay, okay I'll cook up something else. Yes. Sorry? Yes, it is. Uh, okay, so what does a polynomial look like? It looks uh, say b at uh, minus 3 is equal to a0 plus a1 times minus 3 plus a2 minus 3 squared uh, uh, and so forth. So let's do it just with this one. So notice this is equal to minus 3 to the 0 times a0 plus uh, minus 3 to the power 1 a1 plus minus 3 to the power 2 times a2. So here is where 1 comes for, namely the free coefficient in a polynomial, you can think of it as being <laughs> multiplied with the input to the power 0. So this is where the one 